Our scripture this morning is from John chapter 6, verses 1 through 21. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, Gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the water and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Behold, brothers and sisters, the miracle stories of Jesus. We have in the first story the feeding of the 5,000, and we have in the second story Jesus walking on water. These stories are a fabulous testimony to Jesus' power, to his connection to God, the Creator, and to his ability to inspire awe in others. Biblical scholars say of John's Gospel that these miracle stories were a way for the writer of the Gospel to prove who Jesus was. Meaning that telling the stories helped people believe in that time that Jesus was Christ the Messiah of divine capacities. The miracle stories are, um, are a little harder for us to swallow as a postmodern people living 400 years past the age of enlightenment and 20 years after the movie Toy Story was made, right? The completely computer generated movie. Miracles for people used to optical illusion and scientific reasoning are a little suspicious. Are a little suspicious. So there are folks in academic and theological circles whose whole careers have been dedicated to explaining these miracles. Right? For instance, in the feeding of the 5,000, a popular modernist reading of, of that miracle is that after the little boy shows generosity out of his own stash, that people started giving out of their own secret stashes and eventually by the time the meal was over all the hidden food had been brought out, given, and distributed. This is an acceptable explanation of the gospel lesson and is miraculous in its own way. That the heart and model of a child could transform a crowd of thousands is indeed wonderful. Similarly, some scholars say that the storm in the second story impeded the vision of the disciples and what they actually saw was Jesus far away in the distance walking along the shoreline. 
and that um, his motioning for them acted as a kind of lighthouse so that they could get to the shore safely or as the scripture says the boat reached the land toward which they were going. This is another acceptable explanation of the miracle stories, an acceptable explanation of scripture. These interpretations are very generous in that they allow educated, rational people a way to reconcile scripture to what they know and what they can understand from the physical world. But I fear when we read it this way, we miss part of the point. I fear when we read it this way, we lose um, some of the integrity that the resurrection story has for us. If we can't believe in the miracle of the 5,000, how will we ever believe that a man once dead is alive again? I fear that when we read it like this, we rationalize our way out of following Christ into miracle making ourselves. So I choose to read these stories and find life in them. I choose to read them and I choose not to limit what is miraculous about them. I've been reading um, commentaries that actually come from the Presbyterian tradition called Feasting on the Word. When I was reading them this week, one of the contributors, a man named Douglas John Hall, he wrote um, uh, about these miracles and about how it is that we rationalize them. And he came to believe that if we focus too much on the unbelievable parts of the miracle stories, we lose all the nuances that come with them. So he wrote this, he said, When such attention is paid to these extraordinary occurrences, the truly miraculous is obscured. For what is truly wonderful in biblical terms is not that a seeming human could multiply loaves and fishes, but that that human could represent by his words and deeds such a sign of hope and healing that hundreds of needy people would follow him about from town to town. And what is truly awe-inspiring is not that someone could walk on the surface of the water without sinking, but that his presence among ordinary, insecure, and timid persons could calm their anxieties and cause them to walk where they had feared to walk before. And he closes this thought by saying, A people who have grown skeptical about the extraordinary is likely to miss the extraordinary within the ordinary. What all this means is that I choose to read this passage and believe in big miracles because that gives me license to believe in the smaller miracles that occur all the time. To believe in miracles, I don't think, makes a person weak-minded. It instead means you can find wonder and surprises in religion and joy and life and that you can be inspired by them. For instance, let's take my favorite verse because you're a captive audience and I can do what I want. So my favorite verse is verse 12, okay? Jesus and his disciples have just fed everyone and they're still seated before Christ, fully, fully satisfied. And he says to his disciples in verse 12, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. After which Jesus and his disciples gather up the leftovers and fill 12 baskets. That is a big miracle where a small portion of food has been multiplied thousands of times over. If I choose to believe in the big miracle happening here, I can see the smaller miracles underneath. I'm more aware of them, right? I can see, for instance, how Jesus, with such intention, cares for the fragments following the feast. I can see that he has a vision for abundance that persists in times of difficulty. He can see that another feast remains within the fragments. We might think the marvel of the story is that there is enough for everyone. And yet for Jesus enough does not seem to be enough. There is more. A meal that depends on paying attention to what is left behind. On turning toward what has been tossed aside. I can see 
when I accept the big miracle, the smaller miracle that Christ draws the circle wide around fragments, around broken pieces, around leftovers, and I can see that he gathers them up as a sign of wholeness, a foretaste of the banquet to come. And I can see that Jesus invites us, like his disciples, to participate in the miracle, to gather up fragments, to go and do likewise, to take honest stock in our abundance, which is plentiful, and to share it, to let it be transformed by the divine into a holy feast. I was with a group of clergy once. We had decided to do a book study. That's what we're really good at, reading. I don't know if we're good at much else. But I know we're good at reading. So we decided we would gather in this group. We were going to read this book called Longing for Spring, which is written by a fabulous theologian and a clergy person and author, Elaine Heath, um, and, another, and another one called uh, Scott Kisker. And in the book, they cast a vision for what deep communal living can look like for those of us who call ourselves Wesleyans, right? The book explores social holiness matched with monastic practices in a postmodern context. Which basically, it, the point is to show one way that churches can return to their ancient roots of community while also negotiating sort of difficulties of 21st century living. So here I was in this group of clergy, and we've all been reading this book, and we're discussing what it might mean for our communities. And I don't remember the whole conversation, but one thing I do remember is that uh, one of the clergy people in our midst had gathered up the homelessness statistics for her area. And they were staggering. Staggering. And then she had the gall to ask each one of us around the table who lived in parsonages, how many of you have guest bedrooms? In the small group gathered there, we figured out that we had among us 12, 12 empty yet fully furnished bedrooms. It doesn't take long to see how our fragments can be made into a feast for many. If I do not believe in the big miracles of Christ, my mind cannot begin to fathom the overwhelming problem of homelessness in the U.S. But if I do believe in the big miracles, my mind can be set free to look at what appears hopeless and say, we can do something about this. And of course, it isn't just about homelessness, right? We can look toward any problem the world claims is too big, and we can, as it says in Scripture at the beginning of this passage, look upon it with compassion, with hope. We can gather up fragments, the things that have been tossed aside, and make something of them. Let's follow a, a different example, right? In verse 20, the storm is upon the disciples. They're in a bad way. They saw the wrong kind of sunset, right? They're being tossed and overturned, and they are afraid, and they are wet, and they are lost. They then see Jesus in the distance walking on water and Jesus calms their terror by saying very simply, it is I, do not be afraid. Jesus walking on the water is a big miracle. But the other less glamorous parts about Jesus speaking a word of restoration into a time of fear, that miracle is hiding just underneath. In two short clauses, it is I, do not be afraid. Jesus' very presence allows stillness to take place and safety to return. If I can get behind that big miracle, I can see all the places of chaos as potential places of peace. I have a friend named David, uh, a very talented man I went to divinity school with. 
works at a big church in Nashville now. That's where I graduated and he had stayed in town and got hired on by a big church. And he's their minister of missions and he, um, he took a group of folks uh, to Uganda to build wells in the middle of June and upon returning the beginning of July he found out about the massacre in Charleston, South Carolina. And he went to his congregation who are mostly white and mostly privileged and he told them that they need not shy away from this tragedy and the racial issues that lie underneath it but they needed to engage in it honestly and openly to ask questions with good intent to try to understand what we so clearly don't understand. And out of, that uh, out of that conversation, some of the congregants, they got together and they decided that one thing they could definitely do as they um, had, had more conversation about this issue was that they could make prayer shawls to send to the families of the victims. And my friend David, who is ever at the heart of mission, he said, how about we deliver them to Charleston, South Carolina? Let's not just make them, let's go down there and deliver them. So he called a United Methodist minister in the area who after much finagling was able to set up a meeting in Emmanuel AME Church. My friend David flew down immediately after getting permission from the police and from the leadership at Emmanuel AME. He met with the families in the basement of that church and he presented the shawls. He heard the victims' families' stories and he sat with them in the same place where a minister and a congregation of people were gunned down. And he became the stillness in a hurting community. My friend David, he stood firm in the midst of chaos. If David did not believe in the big miracles which are incredible and far-fetched, he would not be able to run toward trouble when everyone else is running away from it. Like a storm on the sea, David stood as an advocate, as a listener, as an ambassador from a mostly white congregation who understands very little about the nuances of the race issue in Charleston, South Carolina, and between this hurting black community that just wants someone to listen. And he spoke words of kindness and peace and clarity. We are capable of these things. So hear these words from the gospel. Right? Choose to believe in the big miracles. Choose to believe in a God whose work is wonder filled so that you can celebrate what abundance waits in a life on this good earth. And remember that whatever we call Jesus, whatever we call Jesus, and we have many names for him, right? What are some of the names that you call Jesus? Did I surprise you? Come on, you know. What are some of the names we have for Jesus? Counselor. Counselor. What was the other one? Messiah. Prince of Peace. Lord. The Prophet. All Merciful. The Grace Giver. Miracle worker, whatever we call Jesus, we have to remember that we are then called to go and do likewise. So believe in the big miracles so that you can hear the call to participate in the miracle working yourself. So be it. Amen.